It was some months ago that Roy extended the invitation to come to this conference, and wanting to be here, I agreed. And then some time passed, and the uh, communications continued. And the later ones always spoke of the relative, uh, the relativism conference. And as I began to wonder what I could do, I became increasingly uneasy about uh, not being sure that I had anything I wanted to say about relativism. So I to try to get my bearings. I went back to the original communication, and I was relieved to see that it said the relative and the rational in the architecture and culture of the present, and spoke of a so-called postmodernist uh, condition. And I, I felt a little better because I, I felt more attuned to thinking about the attempts at rationality in the architecture and culture of the, of the present, and had had some recent confrontations with the postmodernist literature and wanted to build from that point. As I uh, then began to think about that, I also was realizing that my own personal history, which is also very close to Roy's, uh, where we used to sit on the bleachers of the Crown Zellerbach building in San Francisco and discuss the earlier stages, what were now probably the postmodern stages, I suppose, of, of our modern involvement with Hopper, in other words, and others. But in any case, the, the kinds of issues that we had discussed then and the kind of issues that we discuss now had certainly changed, and they had changed, I think, in the direction of certain kinds of relativism. And so I found myself coming around full cycle and beginning to worry that I would come here and the, the philosophers and others would tell us about the very clear distinctions about these and, uh, and recognize these impossible conflations in what I was about to say. Uh, and so I was all prepared to make an apology at the beginning, but now I've been very much comforted by the preceding speakers to, to know that apparently it's quite right to, to have these conflations of relativism and rationalism. To begin, uh, I must locate myself in a field called architecture and also in a temporal situation which uh, has been termed postmodernism in at least the initial call for this conference and in various current discussions. And feeling that if I were actually building, working as an architect, that one might address both these issues, the disciplinary and the temporal ones, simultaneously. Within a work of architecture, it would be an analytical task to distinguish the two sets of issues. In the discursive mode of a conference, I wonder whether to attempt first a position about architecture or about postmodernism. I've chosen to attempt the latter first. One could surely reach the limits of a lecture merely in documenting the many and conflicting ways in which the term postmodernism has already been used. Rather than attempting such a catalog, I prefer simply to re refuse certain positions before taking a stand. At the outset, I propose to concede no authority to the concept of postmodernism. Certainly in its most extended uses, postmodernism already conceals more than it reveals. The term postmodernism appeared early in the discussions of architecture, where it is used more often than not as an umbrella term for an extremely diverse range of not always very compelling innovations. Used in this manner, the term postmodernism does not draw, but rather diminishes distinctions, blunting criticism. At least in this extended and conceptually vacant sense, the use of the term quickly degenerates into the most empty kind of style and zeitgeist mongery. I'm of course, thinking particularly of, of Jenks. But I move here to Frederick Jameson in his postmodernism, or the cultural logic of late capitalism, uh, is correct to resist this sense of postmodernism as style. His proposal to conceive of postmodernism as what he terms a cultural dominant should permit a more selective viewing of postmodern cultural production while giving recognition to other contemporary work even if only for its anachronisms. Nonetheless, Professor Jameson's views of the hegemony of this postmodernist dominant are such that we are returned to an extremely inclusive description. I would suggest that a problem of the postmodern debates is their insistent polarization, postmodern versus modern. There is the first the sharp periodization, followed by aestheticization, the assumption that the purportedly absolute differentness between modernism and postmodernism must be fully revealed in equally distinct cultural styles. Architecture is reduced to the role of a convenient illustration of more profound sources, necessarily as modern under modernism as it is postmodern 
under postmodernism. But are these tautologies so evident? Rare are the works of modern architecture that readily conform to arguable conditions of modernity. What works of modern architecture assuredly possess a self-referential autonomy? Even in works where such autonomy is asserted, their very materiality and their existence in an inhabited world leave the attempt strained, more likely defeated. On the other hand, still within the modern period, social scientists, quite opposed to such autonomies, attempted to come to the aid of architects with positivist and inductivist methods. Few, however, were the architects, especially the more recognized architects, who accepted these methods. Or, to evoke another epistemology of modern times, is there an architecture or an architectural method of falsificationism? Rejection of such an idea did not even await postmodernism. We could find historical examples for these and other attempted relations between architecture and modern epistemologies. We might dub such a collection of ironically failed examples modern while dismissing other contemporary work. Such a, select, such a selection system would, however, miss nearly all the architectural works we take to be modern, whether the rare works of the most recognized architects or the more general fabric of the modern environment. We are faced not with the homogeneity of modern epistemologies and modern architecture, but much more with their disparities. Several possibilities are suggested. The search for unifying epistemologies, styles, or spirits may well obscure the complex relations of any society and the cultural products that are part of that society. A discipline such as architecture may well demonstrate survivals of knowledge and practice familiar from other times, just as it may innovate in ways not yet anticipated elsewhere. For both these reasons, architecture cannot be fully assimilated to the epistemology of some other discipline, even one that is asserted to be the master discipline, the source of the epistem of a period. For that matter, the apparent anachronisms of one discipline may stand as criticisms or potential models, even for the purported master discipline. In contrast to this complexity, Jameson discerns the historical inevitability of postmodern architecture and its oneness with the engendering conditions. He perceives, no doubt rightly in the cases he addresses, and in many others, that in postmodernism, aesthetic production is integrated into commodity production generally. Indeed, in Jameson's view, this co-optation appears to be so much a necessary part of our condition that resistance is apparently foolish. With this absence of opposition, criticism becomes complicit with its subject. Such discussions of architecture, whether by Jenks or Jameson, are justificational rather than critical. Such discourse itself is soon integrated into commodity production generally. The reality of this co-optation is all too evident, both in architectural production and in the propagandizing of the print, exhibition, and other media devoted to current architectural production. Whatever the historical force of this commodification of cultural production, it demands criticism and resistance. I wish to turn to a more demanding construction, which I will term critical postmodernism. It is commonly recognized that a term such as postmodernism asserts in its very form a temporal succession and implies an opposition to modernism. I must say that Jeff Bennington's discussion of Leotard's recent thought opens some uh, very interesting new doors that I'm not going to be able to touch on here. Uh, that would move beyond this particular point that I'm making. Uh, to construct a convincing view of postmodernism uh, in the manner of opposition to modernism obviously relies on an adequate and critically accepted notion of what constitutes modernism. This is not achieved by those who advance the totalizing concepts of postmodernism, which I have just refused. Such writers characteristically support their polemic by creating a modernist foil still more totalizing and void of meaning the reduction, for example, of the whole of architectural modernism to functionalism. There are, however, also more carefully constructed versions of modernism. If such more precise accounts of modernism are opposed, the result is an also more selective and challenging version of postmodernism. In the visual arts, one thinks immediately of the train of criticism initiated by Clement Greenberg's influential account of modernism. Relying on more generally held views about the internalized critical mode of modernist epistemologies, Greenberg sought evidence of a similarly logically driven, self-reflexive mode in art. His consequent theory of modern painting was characterized, to state the case in a phrase, 
by the opacity of the picture plane. A modernist imperative that each medium explore and reveal its own conditions and limits is not universally accepted. Yet Greenberg did employ his approach in such a way as to recognize significant characteristics of acknowledged major works and to array these in a coherent modernist genealogy. His construct provided the basis for a developed critical discourse addressing also works of later date than his thesis. The very success of Greenberg's modernist enterprise in its own time made of it a ready ground against which to pose the characteristics of a postmodernism. As with all such oppositions, much is shared by the contrasting modes. The field and the terms of discourse for the later production are significantly framed by the earlier discourse. As in this case, the selectiveness of the account of modernism is reflected in a cognate, theoretical, and normative selectiveness in the account of postmodernism that is posed in uh, counterposition to uh, Greenberg. Greenberg's concept of modernism has been often criticized, and so too could be any postmodernist position that opposed itself to his construction. In this essay, I am not concerned with the evaluation of these positions, for even, or rather especially, under critical attack, there are at least two important virtues to, to such programs. First, they assert an epistemological position that is of sufficient generality to adduce significant claims and commensurate criticism. Further, with reference to the visual arts, these positions are developed in a dialectical relationship with works of art that are critically judged to be particularly worthy of account. Claims are made as to what deserves our attention and why, and this not merely as an index of the condition of our times, but rather as integral parts of the most challenging accomplishments of uh, these disciplines in the time in question. If I turn now to architecture, I find there is not a modernist versus postmodernist discourse of the same weight as that just referenced in painting and sculpture. Perhaps with a different epistemological position than that advanced by Greenberg, but nonetheless on the model of his enterprise, it should be possible to find a standing for modern architecture. Such a position has not, however, I would argue, been convincingly advanced. Whether from the point of view of modernism or postmodernism, there is a poverty not of modern architecture, but of the theories of modern architecture. Consequently, the strategy of constructing postmodernist architecture and architectural theory by contrasting it with modernist theory yields results that are remarkably, though predictably, weak. Furthermore, while the demanding work of Greenberg and his train should be contrasted positively with the generalities of postmodernist style mongering, in architecture, both the more and less serious expositors of postmodernism founder on the weakness of what they assert modernism to have been. In the discourse on postmodern architecture, one finds over and again the characterization of modern architecture as functionalist. Take as an example the heralded exhibition and book by Heinrich Klotz titled Modern and Postmodern. Klotz's slogan is fiction, not function. The slogan is an effective evocation of his thesis that the distinction between modern and postmodern may be found in the shift of focus from function to fiction. With Klotz, this is a, also a normative distinction, justifying the support of postmodern architecture as against any form of continuity with the modern. An astute architect and commentator like Peter Eisenman, who would never fall into a functionalist analysis when directly addressing modern architecture, can nevertheless make the association when seeking to confirm a position in confrontation with modernism. Or again, Mike Davis, in a convincing criticism of Jameson, nonetheless joins with him, albeit with a different evaluation, in associating architectural modernism with functionalism. Without arguing the point fully here, uh, it is widely recognized that functionalism is, in architecture is a weak concept, inadequate for the characterization or analysis of any architecture. In its recurrent use as the purportedly defining principle of modern architecture, Functionalism has dulled our understanding of both the theories and practice of modern architecture. There is inevitably a poverty of any would-be postmodernist position that re relies on opposition to this weak theory of architectural modernism rather than on a critique and reconstruction of architectural production generally. Thus, the characterization of postmodern architecture, whether attempted all too generally or by comparison with an inadequately conceived modernism, leads to a quite sterile ground. Perhaps another approach can be attempted. In an interdisciplinary conference that is nevertheless directed toward architecture, it may be well to consider an inquiry into architecture
relative to the study of other forms of cultural production. In recent years, the model of the text has been in the ascendant, spreading from studies of literature into other cultural inquiries. Yet even for literature, a field in which the text is the literal rather than the metaphorical form under investigation, criticisms have been raised against the form of discourse engendered. A recurrent theme within the writings of Edward Said is the retreat of literary criticism into a disembodied world of textuality that refuses the worldliness of the text. A parallel theme is the demand that the critic illuminate the world and the text, each through the other. To emphasize these points, Said gave to a recent collection of his essays the title, The World, the Text, and the Critic. On first reflection, architecture may appear to be so deeply and necessarily embedded in the material world that the position, that the problem confronting Said, the neglect of the worldliness of cultural production, could not arise. A collection of essays on architecture, fully sympathetic with Said's position, might reveal the condition of architecture by a variation on his title, The World as the Text and the Critic. At first glance, I like that revised title for what it suggests of the simultaneity of work, I'm sorry, of the simultaneity of world and work in architecture. And I will want to return to that issue. But of course, that is a too particular view of architecture to represent the actual state of affairs. Indeed, there are even readings of this very title, The World as the Text, that suggest the way in which Said's problem presents itself in architecture. The world as the text need not be read, as I first suggested, to emphasize the simultaneity of world and text. There is, of course, the recurring idealist position of seeing architecture precisely in a perceived transcendence of the material world, the successful suppression of worldliness in favor of idea. It is the invitation to read the world solely as text. Such claims for the, idea, for the ideality of architecture are of long standing. Nonetheless, that perception of architecture has been provided a, new, provided a new framework by the same literature of textuality that stimulated the recent discourse in literary criticism and which in turn provoked Said's criticism. In the intellectual fashions of recent years and through borrowings from the same sources, one can identify writings on architecture that reveal this same abstractness. It would then, it would then be possible to construct an essay in parallel with those of Said that criticizes the reduction of architecture to abstruse text, texts, the esoteric texts of architecture. On the other hand, there is an interpretation of the world as text which returns us to an uncritical reading of the architectural world as index, an index of the determining forces which admittedly underlie all cultural production. Architecture as text or architecture as index. It would appear that we are returned to a dichotomy not unlike that which I reached in the first section uh, of this lecture. Architecture as index is indeed another way of speaking of the totalizing interpretation of modernism and postmodernism. The point to which I have come is, in brief, the refusal of architecture as text as well as the refusal of architecture as index. The goal should rather be an understanding of architecture that recognizes what is of value in such a concept as architecture as text but which sees architecture as integral with and only explicable in its worldliness. <coughs> Whether one speaks of architecture as an index <coughs> of the society, or according to my preference, of architecture in its worldliness, it becomes necessary in modern times to engage the profession of architecture. Surely other forms of cultural production are not without their types of professionalism. The fact, however, that architecture is more formally constructed as a profession no doubt reveals some distinctions between architecture and other commonly recognized modes of cultural production. The architectural profession, its licensing, and its legal, li legal liabilities all reveal the recognized responsibility of the architect towards society. In its close association with and close reliance on patron and public as well as systems of production, the profession of architecture is exaggeratedly worldly. In its commitment to production, the profession is often resistant to inquiries that might reveal its ideological uh, and cultural ramifications. It is this extended and worldly, often uncritical production that makes of architecture such a tempting field for generalizations about its indexical relation to a period, generalizations which are not, as we have seen, infrequent in the literature of postmodernism. While the productiveness of the profession is essential to our understanding of architecture, 
We need both a more inclusive and a more critical understanding of architecture. In exercising our critical faculties on both the abstruse architectural theoreticians and on the profession, much can be learned from the critical discourse that develops in other areas of cultural production. But in calling, as I did, for a more inclusive as well as a more critical understanding, I may again have suggested a difference between such problems in architecture and in other areas. Reading Said or the authors in the Greenberg succession, one recognizes well-developed critical discourses that will sustain rigorous inquiry internal to certain forms of cultural production and, however resistantly, externally in their worldliness. I have suggested that architecture is not possessed of equally rewarding references on the side of theoretical discourse and is also particularly bedeviled by the disparities between theory and practice. There is, I think, especially in architecture, a necessity not only to criticize, but also to build a better and more inclusive discourse that will, in turn, better reward criticism. But this ambition is not, I would suggest, absent in an author such as Said either. When he criticizes the abstractness of the discourse of textuality and yet finds its political implications, when he seeks a new discourse that recognizes the worldliness of discourse, then he too is as, is as much involved in theory building as in criticism. Perhaps then it is not only in architecture that we need a tougher, more resilient, and more inclusive understanding of our field. In any case, it is the particular opportunity and difficult challenge of architectural thought and criticism to stake out the ground between the world of practice and the architectural equivalent of esoteric textuality. Much of, much of that world of practice is unreflective, uncritical, but it is also the best of practice that it, it, but it is also in the best of practice that the cogent problems of theory and interpretation are presented. Even a critic who shares Said's concern to hold on to the worldliness of texts cannot neglect the reciprocal enterprise of enriching the interpretive levels through sustained attention to the best of architectural production. The palpable worldliness of the architectural artifact might be thought to guarantee that architectural thought would necessarily explore the ground between production and high abstraction. But here, too, the tendency is to polarize. Technical information of the profession contrasted with the theoretician's too frequent avoidance of the contamination of the material world. Attempts to bridge this gap, such as the theories of tectonics, which are indeed suggestive and deserving of attention, remain themselves all too esoteric. Thus, the worldliness of architecture has proven remarkably recalcitrant, perhaps more of a barrier than a locus for the meeting of thought and action. Nevertheless, the promise of architectural inquiry resides in this need for an inclusive and adequate account of the worldliness of architecture. The fact that architecture inhabits that world more palpably than other forms of cultural production sets distinctive problems, but possibly problems that could provide critical impetus for others concerned with this concept of worldliness. I believe this call for a more inclusive and adequate account of the worldliness of architecture, with its special insistence on mapping the ground between theory and production, will not be the province solely of the theoretician or the practitioner, <coughs> or even of both. The more inclusive understanding begins with an openness to all who make their contributions to architecture. In addition to practitioners and theoreticians, historians, preservationists, clients, builders, and hopefully, with the strength of another time, the amateur. For this inclusive sense of the problematic of architecture and of its actors, I would suggest the term the discipline of architecture. In introduced in this manner, I trust you will recognize that I do not propose this discipline either as an esoteric discourse or as a hierarchical and exclusive structure. Quite the opposite. I am looking for a term, and more importantly, for a way of thinking and working that is inclusive in the two ways I have mentioned. Inclusive, that is, of theory and practice, and of the full range of actors, but also inclusive temporally. Architectural knowledge is not fully adumbrated in the theory and practice of any moment. We need a memory just as we need imaginative projections. Lurking behind what I have just said is something more. There is a discipline of architecture because there is knowledge about architecture which cannot be reduced to any other discipline. It is this irreducibility of aspects of architectural knowledge that suggests an autonomy of architecture and thus threatens to return us to the esoteric of, of certain theories and some limited production. I recall the early part of this lecture rejecting such accounts of, an, of autonomy, but it is, I think, the opposite of obscurantism to claim that architecture serves with a sufficient independence from function, use, and meaning 
that one must recognize what I term the quasi-autonomy of architecture. This quasi-autonomy and its implications for architecture, for society, and for the duration of architecture are essential subjects to the discipline of architecture. Very briefly, I will attempt to be more concrete in what I mean by quasi-autonomy. Every architectural form will sustain multiple interpretations and accommodate a range of uses. Consequently, an architectural form cannot be reduced to a set of semiotic, functional, or any other descriptors. Its independence from such factors and its capacity, capacity to be given a unique description within the discipline of architecture are aspects of its autonomy. Yet, if we were to imagine a grid of potential uses or meanings and the mapping of a specific architectural form upon such a grid, then the location and range of that particular mapping are neither unconditional nor limitless. On the contrary, the characteristics of that mapping stand in relation to real factors of the material and cultural world. The autonomy of architectural form is thus relativized. Even on purely formal terms, the autonomy of, of architectural forms is limited by systems of relations among forms. This quasi-autonomy of architectural forms entails both the irreducibility of the discipline of architecture and the necessity of locating that discipline and its actions within social and historical contexts. In the title of my lecture, The Worldliness of Architecture, both nouns, worldliness and architecture, are emphasized. Some of these issues directly affect the nature and tenability of such periodizations as postmodernism. The assertion of a quasi-autonomy obviously is a claim for only a degree of autonomy. The discipline of architecture does change historically. It may be more or less closely related to the dominant epistemology. It does serve. For all these reasons, it is plausible to seek to identify those characteristics of the architecture of a time and place that ally it with other factors or determinants of that situation. But the degree of autonomy also cuts the other way, partially liberating architecture from the constraints of the time and place of its making. It is insulated in part from whatever may be dominant powers or epistemologies. Even a subservient architect's work cannot be fully or solely a representation of temporal authority or a cultural dominant. A critical or oppositional architect, though also not in command of all implications of a work, may exploit the latitude offered by the quasi-autonomy of architecture. <coughs> For all these reasons, one should neither expect nor encourage that architecture be an index of a time, nor shroud it in ready stylistic terms. I will only mention one other aspect of quasi-autonomy. It, it is this characteristic of architecture that permits it to extend across time and cultures, bearing not only a record of those times and places, but also significance for the discipline of architecture. I have spoken as if my claims about quasi-autonomy were unique to architecture. On the contrary, I expect that quasi-autonomy is a general feature of cultural production, and not only in the arts. The question arises then as to whether through recent critical analyses of the other arts, or through changes in the understanding of knowledge, we are now better equipped to formulate such matters as quasi-autonomy or the nature of a discipline such as architecture. I would like to entertain this question after a brief recall of an issue advanced earlier. I argued that in art, more than in architecture, one may find the term postmodernism used strictly as a confrontation with a well-defined concept of modernism. In this discourse, both the terms modernism and postmodernism are the works, and the works to which they refer are given comparatively narrow and normative definitions. This is a challenging form of discourse and one not readily reduced to generalizations that seek to subsume and consume every manifestation of contemporary society. However, even if one enters this more rigorous discourse about modernism and postmodernism through art criticism, one is soon directed to the epistemological concerns which are taken to characterize the two periods, the positivities, the self-referential certainties that are presumed to characterize modernism and its operative utopianism give way, it is said, to the critical self-doubt of postmodernism. Lyotard is only one of many who recognize a new postmodern period based on new attitudes towards science and knowledge. Yet the two approaches to postmodernism that I have evoked 
the totalizing discourse of the spirit of the times, and the rigorous examinations of select theories of knowledge and works of art are easily conflated. In his foreword to Lyotard's book, The Postmodern Condition, Jameson sees, for example, that the new attitudes toward science and knowledge adduced by Lyotard are appropriately realized in the superficiality of postmodernist architecture. We are returned via Jameson to the non-discriminating use of the term postmodern and even given a justification for accepting the, super the superficiality of the phenomenon. Here again we confront the problem of insistent polarization, periodization, and aestheticization, postmodern versus modern. Compounding the problem is the postmodernist tendency to make a vulnerable half-truth stand as the motive force of the modern period to be overcome. For modern architecture, as we have seen, functionalism is the half-truth so easily attacked. In the polemicizations of epistemology, it is positivism. Modernism is, is said to have been built on a naive positivism, the rejection of which entails a condition of radical doubt. Yet throughout the ascendancy of modernism, functionalism in architecture and positivism in epistemology were under attack. Much of the plausibility of postmodernism devolves from its attack on these same isms. It must be noted, however, that the earlier continuous and considered criticisms of functionalism and positivism, positivism are not subsumed, but rather ignored in the polemical writings of postmodernism. Confusion arises over the different modes and goals of these two forms of criticism of the asserted positivities of the pre or early modern period. It is common in polarized discussions that the argument is established in such a way that the opposing forces, poles, share some critical features. To say it again, postmodernism is correct in rejecting the false positivities of functionalist or positivist positions. When, however, the postmodernists jump from such reasonable but long invoked rejections of untenable positions to conclusions of radical doubt, to overly strenuous denials of truth, value, and knowledge, they protest too much. While claiming to demythologize, they reveal a nostalgia for an ultimately justified knowledge and thus remythologize cultural production. Burdened with this tragic condition, they may work with a false modesty. They also reveal an unwillingness to even note the availability of profound inquiries into the constitution of modern knowledge in the absence of ultimate justifications. They ignore the important bodies of thought which articulately, articulately dismantle even sophisticated versions of positivism, reveal the conventionality of knowledge, and yet maintain the efficacy of such knowledge for itself and within social constructs. The postmodernists characteristically offer simplified, totalizing descriptions of a modern and a postmodern movement in order to affirm a radical break between two periods for which they can then recognize the appropriate aesthetic modes. The continuous criticism of modern knowledge addresses its own crucial problems without either euphoria or despair and without concern for holistic, temporal, or stylistic breaks. In speaking of the continuous critical examination and reconstitution of modern knowledge, I have in mind the contributions of, among others, Thomas Kuhn in the History and Philosophy of Science, Clifford Gerritz in Anthropology, Yehuda Elkanah in the Sociology of Knowledge, Edward Said in Literary and Cultural Criticism. My own teaching and writing, as that of Roy Landau, has given particular emphasis to the methodology of scientific research programs advanced by Imre Lakatosh, elaborated to address such cultural production elaborated by us to address such cultural production as architecture. What all of these inquiries share is a recognition of the conventionality of knowledge, which in turn entails the location of knowledge within society and history. In the authors cited, this recognition of the conventionality of knowledge does not entail an older radical conventionalism with its total rejection of realist claims. The conventionality which I am commending recognizes its worldliness so it recognizes its worldliness. How this is manifested and its implications for knowledge and for so society are the crucial debated issues. I would suggest that these debates about the conventionality of knowledge are not unlike the position I advanced under the rubric of quasi-autonomy. In both cases, there is a recognition of the arbitrary and conventional elements of a human enterprise without disavowing that such constructions engage the world in ways that bound and shape their <coughs> conventionality. There is respect for invention, which cannot but be to some degree arbitrary, unfounded. But, to quote Christopher Ricks, invention must also be discovery. In any case, 
these inquiries, in these inquiries, there is no despair over a loss of, dis of positive knowledge. On the contrary, the acceptance of this conventionality is central to a responsible position in thought and action, expected, expecting neither too little nor too much of modern knowledge, accepting neither authority nor despair as the consequences of examining the history and constitution of knowledge and society. These claims for issues of modern knowledge are, of course, completely general. Returning to architecture, I suggest that this understanding of the conventionality of thought and action should be fruitful for the understanding of architecture. Indeed, I do not see that any field of human activity is privileged over another in offering insights as to the conditions of human thought and action. Well-conceived inquiries into the nature of architecture may provide new insights for other disciplines, and particularly, as I pointed out, because it may have a special kind of uh, involvement in its worldliness. We will not understand how an architecture, including that which is currently known as postmodern, relates to or should relate to its political and cultural environment until we understand that architecture within its discipline and the discipline within its society it is also necessary to be critical to make discriminations within current production. Much of that which is proclaimed as postmodern masquerades as significant innovation or necessary corrective while being regressive intellectually, politically, and for the discipline. In conclusion, I have argued that the weak, periodizing concepts of postmodernism are untenable and uncontributed. The stronger critical reading of postmodernism as an opposition to modernism is reasonable, but for the field of architecture, it founders on the inadequacy of the theories of modernism. I suggest an alternative that prefers criticism of problems and models of periodization. That alternative might be summarized as follows. Any social practice, such as architecture, takes place in a field of overlapping, often competing conventions. Sound practice recognizes the quasi-autonomy of these conventions and thus of their claims on us for their own beauty and order as well as for their possible perpetuation. But sound practice also requires that we recognize the limits and discover the potentials of these conventions within their domain of practice. Conventions and practice facilitate criticism each by the other. They thus can sustain a reasoned and empirically based practice within societies that maintain, that maintain discourse. Thank you. Um, we, we come now uh, to Dimitris Petroas, uh, who I think is a very friendly, very old friend, and somebody has been concerned with very many phases through which the rationalist debate has gone, and I learned that from long discussions with him, uh, and who I'm delighted to have him, in a way, coming back to talking about architecture. He's been the director of Thessaloniki University for, I think, is it four years? For the moment, B. Four years for the moment, yes. And uh, uh, it's so nice to have him uh, talking about architecture after, I'm sure, many years of wrangling about education. So, welcome to Dimitris Petroulos, and we're very pleased to have you here. And the title is Relativism in Architecture, a pseudo question. Well, just at about the end of this uh, long uh, meeting or day, I feel like a post lecturer or like a post mortem. Um, a lot has been said and a lot of uh, analysis of uh, very minutious discussion, very detailed uh, thinking, a lot of uh, theory in the name of non-theory, and so on. So I will try my best to limit my own presentation to some uh, very practical, very uh, non-theoretical uh, propositions. But of course, there is no such thing like non-theory. Everything is theory. Uh, I would like also to say from just the beginning 
but uh, I will try to limit uh, my presentation also to pictorial arguments, to try to leave uh, at the end of this uh, short presentation uh, open on the table questions. It is another way, maybe quite conventional, to, to, to try to present uh, uh, the problems and their solutions. My effort is uh, to present these questions by pictorial manners, by pictorial way. So all the arguments, if they are arguments, will be through the pictorial uh, system. This is why you see this uh, uh, piece of technology over there. I will not try to solve the problems that uh, we're, dis we're discussing now and uh, all of us we think we're thinking continuously by just adding some uh, well-known micro terms such as post, meta, critic, uh, critical, criticism and so on. I got the impression all anyway, the last uh, 15 years, that uh, a big portion, percentage of uh, everyday architectural theory has been treated and solved through these four or five small words, critique, post, meta, and so on. Uh, I'm wondering as uh, not only myself, what will be the next phase of architecture? Since I'm not more in my 30 years or even 28, I have the, the possibility to ask this question. After postmodernism, what? Next postmodernism. After postmodernism, on next, next post postmodernism. Finally, I got the impression sometime, just joking with myself, that uh, after 30 to 40 years, it would be very important to look up a book on architecture because the half of a page could be uh, filled up with post, 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 modern. Treated, trying to, to treat with this way all the well-known for many, many years evolution of the humankind, of human history of uh, human artifacts. Uh, another thing that uh, it, all, it all always uh, interesting me is to try to understand the things, the artifacts, the processes outside the established four, five, ten, no more maybe, uh, terms of the fashion or of any time that uh, happens this description. And I am always sure that if we are able, if we are able to leave aside these uh, terms each time used and stay outside the terms and try to understand from an out, as an outsider what happens, then maybe something important will be uh, present. And something else, and this is true not only for architecture, of course, it is true as well for every social uh, event, for any social artifact, for any social political uh, reality. The reality and the architecture as well is much more complicated, it is much more uh, polyvalent, much more complex than two or three or five terms may describe. If we add the fact that, uh, as uh, has been said just before, that architecture, it looks sure from many years that uh, it is a quasi-autonomous human activity or product, 
then the complexity of the event, it is much more clear. In this context, I guess that it is quite difficult to accept that just by going back to historical repertoire or going back to previous, uh, as I call, uh, style microgeometry of architecture, and I want not to speak about style because style has a lot of associations, and in reality, style is a macrogeometry of the architectural artifact. So, if we want to understand through the context of uh, uh, complexity of the reality what happens, then to use the stylistic repertoire is an oversimplification. It is like a goodwill, why not? It is maybe like a, a good, uh, a, an important uh, sensitivity, but it is not a war, a total uh, love affair. Of course, there are some, uh, many other uh, questions related to to all this predominance of the stylistic repertoire that uh, we are living. For instance, what is uh, the periodicity of some uh, uh, architectural or social or sociocultural uh, manners and how they appear from time to time, not to a very clear cut period and not to exactly the same way. And if I put in a very, very simple way, even now we are passing through a new modernism. And sorry for the use of these old fashioned words like new, modern, postmodern, and so on. A good part of actual architecture is something like the semi modern period of the modern movement of the early 20s, and so on. So this speaks about the continuity of the modernism. I don't think so. This speaks about uh, uh, the reality. I prefer to put the things like this, even with a more obscure way than to oversimplify by adding some titles. So trying to understand with uh, what happens in uh, actual architectural trends. What we may mean by relativism or rational, non-rational and so on. I thought that uh, since all this uh, predominance of the stylistic uh, repertoire has something to do with the critique of the previous period let's call it modern movement, it has something to do with uh, a relativism towards architectural forms and architectural reality. I thought that it would be important, maybe important, to try to understand what really we are using in our days, how we are using in our days what we call classical, neoclassical, classicism, all these stylistic uh, elements that we see so often around us. In this direction, I have a few slides, a few pictorial uh, questions to present. Afterwards, I will try to see if uh, we may speak only about uh, the geometry, the microgeometry of architecture, if we may speak only about uh, style and stylistic repertoire or stylistic manners, and uh, if it is much more important and much more near the complexity of the architectural artifact, to speak uh, with a more holistic way, 
and since holistic has a lot of connotation, let's say to speak, trying to put in the description not only the microgeometry, let's call it style, not only historical previous events, but also has been also as has been also presented uh, in this uh, series of uh, uh, presentations this day today with uh, space with uh, other elements of uh, an uh, architectural situation and in that case if we are able to try to understand and uh, give the description of the architectural event with uh, a complicated way, that is, with a way parallel to that of the complexity of the reality, then maybe it would be possible just to try to understand in a different way what means historical withdrawal to history, or historical references, or even uh, relative or non-relative or pseudo-relative or creative reality relative or critical relative and so on approaches that uh, we are always uh, seeing around us. Well, it is just uh, a series of very few uh, icons, images, slides, everything. It seems that it is almost the same, not exactly the same. So this is a small house in Greece, of course, uh, of the late 19th century, typical neoclassical with this historicist way. This is the same house, but with another microgeometry. I am not. Uh, I have not the intention to make any explanation. It is just some very simple pictorial uh, arguments. I hope that uh, the pictorial event in itself, per se, has its own power and its own possibility to explain itself. And I will try, like uh, the diable, to avoid explanations. This is another microgeometry of the same exactly small house, with the same openings, with the same uh, dimensions, and so on. Again, what happens, I don't know. This is exactly what I'm wondering, maybe for many years. This is again. In this way, we may try to transform a well-known building of a given style to a series of uh, various and contradicting uh, historical positions of architecture. This is a, as it is maybe obvious, a system, a, a group of uh, modern movements, uh, uh, architectural uh, products, product. But this is exactly the propylean of uh, Acropolis, just by transforming the microgeometry, nothing else. This is also a system of architecture with a microgeometry uh, in a well-known way to adapt uh, the visual organization 
or this one without this small touch of color. But this is the erection necropolis. Again, the erection in another way transformed. What, what is uh, what really persists in this uh, uh, building, in this architecture? My hypothesis is that uh, it is something more than microgeometry. And uh, let me say, I argue, that they have a, a strong power and very important uh, quality as architectural artifacts, either with uh, this way or this way, or this way. This is an eclecticistic uh, uh, complex of buildings with a stoa, with a portico, or with a arcade, and uh, with uh, well-known micro-geometry of uh, neoclassical eclecticistic uh, uh, solutions. This is the other side of this same building, but this is the actual reality. A 16th century a Byzantine monastery in Crete, outside uh, the city of Hanya. And this is the drawings of the actual situation. And this is the courtyard of this monastery. And one of the plants, the ground floor. Now, another effort to understand what may happen. This is a neoclassical market. I, I'm sure that I presented this market again in this room six years ago. Uh, of the late 19th century or the beginning of 20th century in the island, or, or no, uh, in a small port outside Athens, Telabrium. And this is another view of the same typical neoclassical building. But this is m maybe a transformation without the microgeometry, the stylistic uh, repertoire. The same here with another system of construction, another system of geometrical representation. And this is the other part of the same small market. And this is one way to keep the same special organization, the same system of courtyards, covered passages, openings, dimensions, uh, corridors, everything, but just transform the microgeometry. This is also the same with another microgeometry. And this is the uh, plan of this small market. We may try to see what happens with this uh, small market, trying to understand how the various uh, uh, configurations, as I call, of space uh, are uh, uh, organized in a system and uh, the special organization, the organization of the space of this small market is produced. I mean by uh, 
configuration of space, uh, microsystems of space without dimension, without uh, color, without uh, any visual quality. For instance, a configuration of space is uh, a stoa, is a patio, and so on. And this is maybe one of the way that we may try to explain the organization of space. And now, I am not intended to fill up my 40 minutes. I hope that uh, this series of pictorial questions may try to keep your minds much more time than my poor 40 minutes. This is Acropolis, and it is a typical, the typical, classical use of classical architecture. What happens? It is only the buildings A, B, C, D, O, or 1, 2, 1, 2. It depends on the way that we want to put into the computer. It is only Parthenon and Erechtheon and Propylia and everything else with their stylistic uh, characteristics. Of course, it is not only that. And Acropolis and Parthenon and Erechtheon and all the other small buildings there, all of them, they have, they behave with our, with their uh, context, and it is not the context of the building, it is the building itself. It is not the courtyard plus the, uh, for instance, uh, the erection, but it is uh, this total entity that it is erection. If we try to say this is erection, the building, the contour of the building, and then the courtyard, and then so and so, then it is not. Uh, uh, interesting to speak about architecture. It is not architecture, it is not a social event. It is maybe a part of a construction, nothing more. So we see that there are two things I don't say important. I hope that uh, you will judge if they are important or not. The way that we enter it is not an axial way for the whole uh, complex. Then it is not the axial way to enter in this uh, Artemis uh, place. Again, only here, but it is not again uh, axial because it is not this one parallel to that. We enter the, the main, main belly of Parthenon with a non-axial way just uh, from the side and uh, by <coughs> no entering with a typical, as actually everybody almost is arguing, with a typical axial entrance. Almost everything that actually it is presented as a neoclassical or classical architecture building is always presented with axial organization with a strong uh, center and so on. And then it is uh, this one which is the erection with a small courtyard and a second courtyard and another courtyard, a system of courtyards like a small settler. And it is a very small building indeed. And then here combining Erechtheon and Parthenon, there is another system of courtyards, of, of walls, of the height of two and more, two meters, and uh, also the same happens in another small place, small building there. So we have first non-symmetrical solutions, non-axial uh, accesses, and then we have, in each case of a building, a system of open and or semi-open uh, spaces, courtyards and so on. And each one of those, it is not only the classical designed, the microgeometry 
this building or the other building, etc. But it is a system of uh, various spaces. Now, what means the last one? Means the last mean, uh, means that when we are entering from the main complex of uh, Propylia, we don't see neither the main uh, symbolic building Parthenon with a typical axial way, but not only that, but we see only a part because it is hidden behind this wall. And uh, in front of this wall, there is a lot of small constructions, architectural artifacts, relating distances and creating a almost complete ambiguity of the situation. The same is clear here. This is another courtyard. We enter this non-axial door that we saw in the previous case, and we enter the Artemis uh, uh, building. Again, we don't see even the building. Another case of the same uh, complex. You see, here is Parthenon. There is another way to present uh, the wall. It is a wall with uh, stoneworks. And there is a split of levels. There is various intermediary uh, limits of the organization of space. And all these drawings, they are made 20, 25 years ago by an archaeologist architect, just trying to understand the real situation as an archaeologist, nothing else, without any intention to study the organization of space. Maybe this famous Greek architect, working with the American Archaeological School, Yannis Travlos, he, he, did not, uh, he does not care if uh, it was a system of, uh, of courtyards of semi-open spaces, of in-between organization. And here is another building of the Asclepion, the first century after Christ. If we know when Christ, of course, was born, but that's another story. And uh, you see also that we have an unaxial uh, entrance. We are passing through this uh, very narrow street corridor, and then a non-symmetrical uh, courtyard, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I would like also to mention something else that I forgot just before to try to explain, that we are passing through this, uh, say, transparency of uh, the Erechtheon system of columns, with uh, this uh, corridor with a very narrow sense, and then we are going to a very open space, and then we are going through this corridor like a small villages uh, uh, street. My argument is quite clear that uh, all this architecture that it is considered as uh, a typical, it is, a typical uh, classical architecture. It is not classical following the way that actually is described and is presented. It is much more clear, it is much more near a medieval settlement than to what actual architecture or 19th century architecture is arguing that classicism is. Where now in all this discussion relativism, rationality, and so on stands, maybe in my mind. This is, uh, again, the erection. You see the small, the small first courtyard, the other the semi-closed place over there, the, the, the bigger courtyard, non-axial uh, 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 organization, a lot of things that you may find maybe in a lot of uh, uh, modern movements uh, of the late period 
or of the Team 10 uh, efforts, uh, and of course, in many all around the world, medieval and post medieval, after medieval uh, periods. Yeah, and this is another case also of the Agora near Athens. It is not uh, necessary to try to explain what happens. By the ra uh, red line, you see some of the axes of the way that uh, we're approaching the buildings and so on. Where is uh, the typical neoclassical argument that it is presented all around Europe and the uh, United States and all around the world. And this is some sketches of the complex of, of Acropolis where all the stylistic uh, events that is the micro microgeometry is uh, ousted and it is just a way to understand barriers, difficulties of the movement, semi-closed spaces and so on. To my mind, it looks like a Mediterranean village in the northern of, in the south of uh, continent. The same here? No, it's not the same. This is another way to understand classicism. And this is another way to understand classicism by painting ornament of classical uh, thinking into a typical, without any judgment of uh, evaluation, a painting a classical, as it is called, uh, uh, ornament into a typical modern movement building. It is easy to, to see what will happen if you put out the painting of uh, these classical ornaments and everything else, and the building is alone with the holes and so on. And the last one, which is pre-postmodern, but neoclassical, a small building by von Speer. That's it, thank you.